Good afternoon. My name is Erwin Chemerinsky, and I'm tremendously fortunate to be the Dean of Berkeley Law. This is a very special occasion for us. It is the inaugural Herman Hill K. Memorial Lecture. Herman Hill K. taught at Berkeley Law for 57 years. She was the second woman to be on the Berkeley Law faculty. She spent a decade as dean, the first woman dean on the faculty. She was a mentor to literally thousands of students. She was an expert in many fields of law, family law, conflicts of law, feminist jurisprudence. This is what I hope will be the first of many lectures to come in honor of Herman Hill Kay. And we could not possibly have a more distinguished speaker to be the inaugural Herman Hill Kay Memorial Lecture than Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. for you the program for the afternoon. I'm going to do all of the introductions at the beginning because you're not here to listen to me. You're here to hear the inaugural Herman Hill K. Memorial Lecture. I am going to yield the podium to our Chancellor, Carol Christ. Just a quick introduction for those who haven't had the wonderful opportunity to meet Chancellor Christ. After getting her degree in English, a PhD from Yale University, she joined the Berkeley faculty as an English professor in 1970. She was thus a colleague and close friend with Herm Hill Kay for many years. She went from being professor, to being chair of the department, to being dean, to being executive vice chancellor and provost. She then went to Smith College, where she served as president for 11 years, coming back to join the faculty at Berkeley. She then stepped in as interim executive vice chancellor and provost, and in 2017, became our chancellor. As I said on other occasions, I've been a law professor a long time, but I've never seen a university president or chancellor as universally admired, revered as Chancellor Christ. After Chancellor Christ, we're then going to hear reflections on Herman K. from Justice Ginsburg. I know it is cliche in introducing a speaker to say that the person needs no introduction, but I cannot imagine an instance where it's more true than this one. After all, this is the first justice in history who's widely publicly known by just initials. <laughs> so just a quick biography. She attended Cornell University and then Harvard Law School and Columbia Law School. After working as a researcher, she became a professor at Rutgers Law School and then at Columbia Law School. She was the founder of the ACLU Women's Rights Project, and she litigated the initial landmark cases before the Supreme Court with regard to women's rights. She was appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit by President Jimmy Carter, and in 1993, President Bill Clinton named her to be an Associate Justice on the United States Supreme Court. After Justice Ginsburg, we'll hear reflections from my colleague, Professor Paniel Samuelson. For Samuelson, went to the University of Hawaii and then to Yale Law School. She then became a very distinguished law professor, literally one of the leading figures in the areas of intellectual property law. She was also a colleague of and close friend to Herman K. for many years. I also must take a moment and thank Pam Samuelson, her husband Bob Glushko, for originating the idea of having an annual Herman Hill K. Memorial Lecture, for donating funds to get it started, and many of our faculty have also contributed funds. So I said this is a lecture series to go on for many years to come. Then the lecture itself will be a conversation between Justice Ginsburg and Berkeley Law Professor Amanda Tyler. And my colleague, Professor Tyler, seated obviously with Justice Ginsburg on the stage. Professor Tyler went to Stanford and then to Harvard Law School, clerk for Judge Guido Calabresi in the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, then had the wonderful privilege of clerking for Justice Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. After time in private practice, she was a professor at George Washington University Law School and joined the Berkeley Law faculty seven years ago. She's an expert in areas such as civil procedure and federal courts. And I must thank Amanda here for all of her efforts in bringing Justice Ginsburg to be the inaugural lecture in the Herbal K Memorial Series. Finally, before I leave the podium, I need to extend thanks. Putting together a large event like this 
is a tremendous amount of work. And many people in the law school really did work tirelessly to have it happen. So I want to thank Thembi Ann Jackson, who's the head of event service, Whitney Mello from the dean's office, Holly Johnson, who works in our development office. And I also want to thank our communication staff, especially Alex Shapiro and Rachel Deletto. And if I could, I'd love to have a round of applause for all of these people who put this event together. And with that, we'll begin the program hearing from our terrific chancellor, Carol Christ. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on this very special occasion. It's both a tremendous privilege and a true pleasure to welcome U.S. Supreme Court Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg to campus for Berkeley Law's inaugural Herma Hill K. Memorial Lecture. Justice Ginsburg is one of the nation's most important legal minds. She's an embodiment of quiet yet forceful persistence. She's a feminist icon and she's a role model for millions. Over more than half a century, she has fought for women's equality under the law, founding the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU, winning landmark victories in five of the six cases she um, argued before the Supreme Court, and supporting gender equality from the bench, even as she has herself opened doors for women that had been previously shut becoming the first tenured woman professor at Columbia Law, and ultimately the second woman on the United States Supreme Court. Justice Ginsburg joins us today in part to honor and memorialize her friend and fellow trailblazer, former Berkeley Law Dean Herma Hill Kay, after whom this new speaker series is named. When Herma first joined Berkeley in 1960, she was the second woman on the law faculty, hired only when the first, Barbara Armstrong, announced her retirement. Despite encountering all manner of obstacles, Herma thrived here, becoming a leading scholar in three separate fields of law, conflict of laws, family law, and sex-based discrimination law. As a scholar of conflict of laws, she authored some of the most important works of the second half of the 20th century, including lectures on government interest analysis that she delivered at the Hague Academy of International Law in 1989. As an expert in family law, she was the primary drafter of the California Family Law Act of 1969, the nation's first no-fault divorce law, and the Uniform Marriage and Divorce Act which has served as a template for state's laws nationwide. And as a discrimination law scholar, in 1974, she co-authored with then Professor Ruth Bader Ginsburg the first case book on sex-based discrimination. Herma's brilliance, grace, humor, tact, moral compass, and unyielding resolve saw her shatter barriers in both the legal world and at Berkeley, and she served as our first woman law dean from 1992 to 2000. Afterwards, she returned to teaching, completing an astonishing 57 years of service to our university before her death in 2017. I admired Herma from the time I joined the faculty in 1970, when only 3% of the faculty were women. I looked eagerly for women to serve as role models, to show me how to be as a woman, a scholar, and a professional. Herma was that to me. I got to know her well when I was provost in the 1990s, and she was dean of the law school. We frequently had lunch at the Women's Faculty Club. I saw her character and her extraordinary intelligence in those lunches, her deep commitment to women's issues and to family issues, her love for the university, her sense of humor, her wisdom. I think she would be so pleased with this as the first Herma Hill K Memorial Lecture. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you in particular to Professor Pam Pamela Samuelson and her husband, Dr. Robert Glushko, for their generous seed gift that led to the creation of this series. 
as legal scholars, both Justice Ginsburg and Herma Hill Kay were, in Herma's words, part of a small band of outsiders who braved rejection, isolation, and hostility to establish an initial foothold in legal education. They helped pave the way, pave the way for a proliferation of women lawyers, judges, and law professors, and their broader impact has been felt throughout the nation and in so many aspects of society. The ground they broke is now well trod, and we hold them in our debt. And now to share her own reflections on Herma, here is Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Irma Hill Kay was the 15th woman to hold a tenure track position at a law school accredited by the Association of American Law Schools. For more than 25 years, she devoted her time and talent to bringing vivid, vividly to life the work and days of the 14 women who preceded her in appointments to AALS accredited law faculties. And in a final chapter, she wrote of the women who came next, achieving tenure track appointments in the almost three score years since 1960. Retrieving this history was a huge undertaking, one of inestimable value. The book remains unpublished, but I know the Berkeley faculty wants genuinely to honor Herma, and so it will be relentless in making sure the work for which I wrote the introduction at Herma's request in August 2015 is soon in print. To tell the story of the first 14, Herma read their publications. She personally interviewed the nine still alive when she embarked on the project. And for all of them, she elicited the remembrances of colleagues when available and scores of students. Without Herma's prodigious effort, we would scarcely comprehend how women altered legal education and the law itself. Most of the pioneers, the seven appointed from 1919 to 1949, and the equal number appointed in the next decade, did not think of themselves as exceptional or courageous. 11 were married, nine had children. Several were family law scholars, but most taught in diverse areas, including commercial law, corporate law, and oil and gas law. As one of them commented, we didn't talk about what we were doing, we just did it. Different as they were, they shared a quality essential to their success, perseverance. And all of them overcame the odds against them for the same reason. They found law study and teaching tremendously fulfilling. Reading Hermer's manuscript more than four years ago, I found one thing missing. Hermer told us almost nothing about herself. It was fitting I decided to address that omission by devoting most of my introduction to Hermel Hill Kay, law teacher, scholar, reformer, nonpareil, and my treasured friend. These remarks convey what I wrote about Herma. When Herma was a sixth grader in a rural South Carolina public school, her teacher witnessed her skill in debate and suggested what she should do with her life. 
she should be a lawyer. Undaunted by the profession's entrenched resistance to women at the bar, that is just what Herma set out to do after earning her undergraduate degree from Southern Methodist University in 1956. Initially told by famed law professor Carl Llewellyn that she didn't belong in law school, Herma rejected that bad, bad advice and she became a stellar student at the University of Chicago Law School. There, she worked as a research assistant for path-marking conflict of laws scholar Brainerd Curry and co-authoring two leading articles with him. On Professor Curry's recommendation, Hermer gained a 1959 clerkship with California Supreme Court Justice and later Chief Justice Roger Traynor, a jurist known for his brilliance and equally for his humanity. Despite Traynor's strong endorsement of Herma, Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, wasn't up to engaging a woman as his law clerk in 1960, nor were his fellow justices. Traynor's recommendation carried heavier weight with the Berkeley Law Faculty, where Herma commenced her career in the academy. And in just three years, in 1963, she became a full professor with tenure. Inspired and encouraged by Berkeley's distinguished Professor Barbara Armstrong, first woman to achieve tenure at any law, law school in the USA, Herma made family law her field of concentration along with conflict of laws. At a young age, uncommon for such assignments, in 1968, Herma was reported co-reporter of the Uniform Marriage and Divorce Act. That endeavor of the National Conference on Uniform State Laws launched no forced divorce as an innovation that would sweep the country in 10 years. In the ensuing years in California and elsewhere, Herma strived to make marriage and divorce safer for women. Hermer and I first met in 1971 at a Yale Law School-sponsored Women in the Law Conference. For the rest of that decade, she was my best and dearest working colleague. Together with Kenneth Davidson, then at SUNY Buffalo Law School, we produced, in 1974, the first published set of course materials on sex discrimination and the law. Before our first conversation, I knew Herma through her writings. She co-authored with Roger Crampton and David Curry the casebook I used in teaching conflict of laws. Her extraordinary talent as a teacher I knew well, had garnered many awards, lectureship invitations, and visiting offers. I was also aware of Herma's reputation as a woman of style who had a private pilot's license, flew a Piper Cub weekly, and navigated San Francisco Hills in a sleek yellow Jaguar. <laughs> Herma had a remarkable quality not readily captured in words. A certain chemistry was in play when one met her, something that magically made you want to be on her side. Herma's skill in the art of gentle persuasion accounted in significant part for the prominent post she held in legal and academic circles. In 1973 and 1974, she chaired Berkeley's Academic Senate from 1992 until 2000, she served as Berkeley Law School's valiant dean, meeting severe budgetary constraints by honing her skills as a fundraiser, planning for the law school's new home, promoting depth and diversity in faculty appointments, and making the place more user, user 
conscious and user-friendly. An unflinching partisan of equal opportunity and affirmative action, Herma managed to reset Berkeley Law School's course to advance the admission of African-American and Hispanic students after the initial shock of Proposition 209, California's strident anti-affirmative action measure. Before and after her deanship, she served the university and the university senate in various capacities, sitting on or chairing by her own reckoning, 50 zillion committees. <laughs> Outside the university, she played lead roles in major legal institutions. She served on the executive committee of the ALS for four years and became ALS president in 1989. She chaired the association's nominating committee in 1992 and was a member of the Journal of Legal Education editorial board from 2001 to 2004. Herma was secretary of the American Bar Association's section on legal education and admissions to the bar from 1999 to 2001. She was an executive committee member of the American Bar Foundation from 2000 to 2003, and both council and executive committee member of the prestigious American Law Institute from 2000 to 2007. In the private philanthropic domain, she chaired the Russell Sage Foundation Board from 1980 to 1984, and the Rosenberg Foundation Board from 1989 to 19, from 1987 to 1989. For many years, she served as sole woman on the editorial board of the Foundation Press, and she counseled the then brand new Senator Dianne Feinstein on judicial appointments. In that capacity, she strongly supported my nomination to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1993. Herma was a proponent of interdisciplinary education, team teaching law and anthropology with Laura Nader in the early 1960s, and later law and psychiatry with Irving Phillips. As dean of Berkeley Law School, she launched the Center for Clinical Education and made clinical experience a mainstay of the curriculum. At the Hague Academy of Private International Law in the summer of 1989, she delivered a series of influential lectures defending Pre Professor Bernard Curry's interest analysis approach to resolving conflict of laws, showing how stunningly she could perform outside an academic milieu. In 1978, she argued flawlessly before the U.S. Supreme Court the His Square Doe gender discrimination case. I was in the audience. It was Herma's first document before a federal appellate bench, and it could not have been better. A new chapter opened in Herma's life in 1975 when she married psychiatrist Carol Brodsky, widowed father of three boys, the youngest 12, the older boys in their teens. Carol was as loving and supportive as a partner in life can be. Each week during her misdeanship, Carol sent a gorgeous floral display to Bright the Dean's workspace. And although Herma stopped piloting planes when she took on the joys and burdens of family life, she became an avid swimmer and an accomplished gardener growing roses and orchids on the balcony of her Telegraph Hill apartment. Herma's persistent endeavor for well over a half century was to shape the legal academy and the legal profession to serve all of the people law exists or should exist to serve, and to make law a protector of women's capacity to chart their own life's course. No person was better equipped than Herma 
to write about the women in law teaching who paved the way for later faculty and student generations, populations that reflect the capacity, diversity, and talent of all of our nation's people. Her comprehensive and engaging presentation of the history of women in legal education is cause for celebration. It has lingered too long in unpublished state and I am so pleased to know that before much longer, it will be in print. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Ginsburg, for this enormous tribute to Herma Hill Kay. Uh, I am here, uh, like the Justice, to pay tribute to uh, Herma Hill Kay. Um, uh, relatively few of the people who are here today uh, had the benefit of having uh, Herma either as a colleague or as a, a, a teacher. Um, I had the pleasure of having both of those experiences, uh, but partly I want today uh, to uh, uh, help you understand how important she was uh, to the law school, uh, to the legal profession, uh, and how much she did. Uh, so that was one of the reasons that we decided to create this, uh, uh, this this lecture series so that you would know what an amazing person Herma Kay was uh, and how lucky we were to have her uh, as uh, our dean for a period of years and uh, a colleague at the law school, as you heard, for uh, 57 uh, years, which is amazing. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, talk about uh, uh, her mostly through pictures. Uh, so one of the things about Herma Kay is her hair was always perfect, um, and <laughs> mine never was was, but, um, uh, but I thought that was a, you know, this shows that it went back a, a long ways. This is actually a picture of her, uh, one of six women who had been admitted to the bar uh, in California the year that she was admitted. There were 140 people uh, admitted to the bar and only six women. That's Herma with a fancy hat in the middle. Um, and here's a picture of her as a, a teacher. This is how I first got to know her. Uh, I had moved to, uh, uh, to San Francisco in the hope of building up residency in the state of California so that I could go to Berkeley Law School um, uh, the following year. I was working as a paralegal, and somehow I found out about the class that she was teaching in the evening about women in the law. And I said, I want to know what it feels like to go to law school. I want to have a, an experience like this. So every week after I finish my job. I'd basically get in the bar and come over and uh, par participate in this uh, class. Uh, and I learned so much. And one of the things that I learned is that women aren't treated, uh, or weren't at that time, treated as, uh, as equals of men. Uh, and I thought that was outrageous. And so uh, that actually helped motivate me uh, further to go to law school uh, and to have Herma as my, uh, as my uh, inspiration. Uh, and of course, part of the reason why we're doing this lecture series is I'm only one of many thousands of women uh, in particular who were uh, inspired by her and who were mentored by her uh, and who had the luck to have her as a, as a teacher. Uh, she was as good a teacher to the men as she was to the women. One of the things that I liked about her was that she liked everybody uh, and she was so good in the classroom. She won awards for teaching as well as so, uh, for so many other things. This is actually a picture of her uh, as the dean of the law school, the first woman, uh, as you know, uh, to have uh, been named uh, for uh, uh, as the dean, uh, first woman to be named as the dean of this particular law school. And one of the things that she did that uh, I think she was very proud of uh, was she helped hire more women and hire uh, minority faculty members. Uh, and this is uh, some of the group that uh, she had recruited by uh, before I actually joined the faculty in 1996. But you can imagine what a thrill it was for me after having had her as a teacher uh, before I went to law school to come back 
to Berkeley uh, and to have her uh, as my uh, as my dean. Uh, and uh, she was a champion uh, not only for a hiring uh, of uh, women and uh, minorities, but also uh, she founded uh, or helped to found and supported the founding of the Center for Social Justice, which was actually a, a, an initiative that helped to make the uh, community know that uh, that the people who were applying to law school who are interested in social justice, you can come to Berkeley and you can actually do that. And it's one of the most vital centers uh, that we have now uh, at the law school. She also championed uh, the hiring uh, uh, and, of and the creation of in-house clinical legal education. Uh, initially, there was some resistance uh, about, uh, about doing that uh, because it's very resource intensive. And for some faculty, it just seemed like skills training. Uh, but in fact, uh, Herma and uh, Eleanor Swift, who helped uh, uh, create this uh, Center for uh, Clinical Le Legal Education, uh, were just prescient in kind of realizing that experiential learning is a really important and valuable part of what law school can offer. So, Here's a, a picture of her with some of the deans, the former deans of the law school uh, in the same suit. Uh, but I wanted to actually also convey what a vital person she was, what a great sense of humor she had, uh, and how much she actually uh, tried to make uh, life kind of interesting. So there's her with her plane, uh, with a dog. Look at how elegant she is uh, in her black tie uh, outfit. Uh, here she is singing, uh, actually, at uh, uh, a faculty uh, uh, sketch. Uh, and play ball. Um, she's really good at that too. Um, and she helped uh, to oversee the construction of uh, what became uh, South, uh, the, sort of the, the building that many of us, act, North Edition that many of us have. This is another picture of her with, uh, uh, with Decanal people. This is her signature yellow uh, jacket. She loved that jacket she wore all the time. Um, I loved that jacket too. Uh, she was great with our alums. Uh, she really uh, was a, a great um, uh, person to, to actually, some deans are actually a little shy. She went shy. Um, I really, I think she was a great person. Uh, here she is with Eleanor Swift uh, uh, celebrating, and here she is with uh, her granddaughter and with a couple of other students. Uh, and uh, this is the Lifetime Achievement Award that. Uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg and Herma Kay won, uh, I think it was in 2015, uh, and here is a picture of her in that signature yellow jacket um, uh, uh, giving some remarks, uh, and this is the two of them uh, receiving the, uh, the award at the AALS. <laughs> And with that, I'll, I'll let you see two of her uh, for the rest of the uh, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, well, I have the distinct privilege of speaking on behalf of everyone here at UC Berkeley and saying, welcome, Justice. We are very thrilled to have you here and to have you here for such a very special occasion, honoring Herma Hill Kay. Now, as everyone knows, you have recently had your fourth bout with cancer. So I have to ask, how are you? Compared to how I was six months ago, very well. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, you've, you've given me my opening to ask you my next question, which I've been dying to ask you. As everyone here probably also knows, I believe you're the only Supreme Court justice whose personal trainer has published a workout book <laughs> around your regimen. So I, I have to ask, oh, and I know you're also a regular at the justice's gym. Are, are, you, are you back at the gym? Yes, I, I never left it. Even in my lowest periods, I couldn't do very much, but I did what I can. I have been working with Brian Johnson, author of the RBG workout book, <laughs> since 1999. We started at the end of my first cancer bout, colorectal cancer. My husband said, you look like a, an Auschwitz survivor. You must do something to build yourself up. So I asked around. Brian. Uh, when he's not training, is uh, 
on the clerk's office staff at the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. We have been working together since 1999. Well, um, you'll just have to let me know when you're ready to run a marathon with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite up to that, but, <laughs> but I do push-ups, planks, front and side, lots of weight-bearing exercises. The Bryant, for a time, also helped Justice Breyer and Justice Kagan. We, we'll have to ask him when we get here who his favorite client is. <laughs> so I, I wanted to say a few words at the outset about Herma Hill Kay. As, as your remarks highlighted, you two were friends going back decades. And you two actually graduated from law school the same year, 1959. But as you said, you met years later. And it's, it's really um, exciting and interesting to me, and I think will be to the audience, that you wrote the first book on gender discrimination in response to requests from your students. Yes. And a little known fact is that the women of Berkeley Law had a huge celebration when that book came out here. And another thing that you mentioned uh, is that the first woman appointed as a law professor at an ABA and ALS approved law school was here, Barbara Nocktree Noc Armstrong. She was appointed in 1919, which is exactly 100 years ago. And so that's something that we're very proud of here at Berkeley. Now, Herma, as I think you mentioned, was the 15th professor, woman law professor appointed at such a school, and you were the 19th. Um, and you talked about Herma's book and how important it is that we preserve it. And I, I just have to say that I, I'm really excited to see it and to see your introduction and her um, chronicling of the stories of these first women law professors in print. So hopefully we will see that within the next year. And maybe we'll be able to entice you back for a celebration. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your life. I have read that you um, have said on occasion that you were not thinking that you would be a lawyer when you were a kid. But I've also recently been reading a book that you put together, which is a compilation of things that you've written. And in it, in, there is a passage from uh, something that you wrote for your student newspaper when you were 13 years old. And you talked in that piece about the importance of, among other things, the Magna Carta, uh, the English Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence. Now, I'm not sure, but that sounds like somebody who's thinking she might become a lawyer. <laughs> it, it was a very hopeful time. It was the end of World War II, and I listed as the last of these great documents the then new UN mm -hmm. Charter. There was a dream of one world at peace, and that's, that's what prompted that article. But I didn't think about the legal profession because women were not there. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. And you go to college at Cornell. And you've told me in the past that that's where you started to think about maybe becoming a lawyer. How, yes. how did that happen? Yes. I was at Cornell from 1950 to 1954. Not very good years for our country. There was a huge Red Scare, and there was a senator from Wisconsin, Joe McCarthy, who saw a communist in every closet, and who was hauling people before the House on American Activities Committee, the Senate Internal Security Committee, and badgering them about organizations they had belonged to, socialist organizations, in the height of the Depression in the 1930s. I was then a research assistant to a great teacher, Robert E. Cushman. He taught constitutional law to undergraduates. And he wanted me to be aware that our country was straying from its most fundamental values. 
He pointed out that there were lawyers standing up for people, called before the investigating committees, lawyers who were reminding our Congress that we have a First Amendment guaranteeing us the right to think, speak, and write as we believe, and not as a big brother government tells us is the right way to think, speak, and write. And also that we have a privilege against self-incrimination. So reading about what those lawyers were doing, I got the idea that being a lawyer was a pretty nifty thing. <laughs> I hoped that I could get a paying job, but also spend my time trying to make things a little better in the communities in which I live. Now something else happened when you were at Cornell. You, made a, you, you met, excuse me, a certain handsome member of the golf team named Marty Ginsburg. So what was different about him as opposed to some of the other guys on campus? Okay. <laughs> I said, uh, Marty was the first boy I ever dated who cared that I had a brain. <laughs> and we started out as best friends. Marty had a girlfriend at Smith College, and I had a boyfriend at Columbia Law School. But there was a long, cold week in Ithaca. <laughs> and Marty had a great Chevrolet. Uh, we would go to the movies together. We'd go to the college spa and speak about anything and everything. And then it dawned on me, after not too long, that Marty was ever so much smarter than my boyfriend at Columbia Law School. <laughs> so, as, as, as I, I don't want to say anything and get myself in trouble with my former colleagues, uh, and one in particular who's now the dean of Columbia Law School, so I'm going to just move right on. <laughs> Um, now, as I understand things, together you decided that you would pick a profession in the same profession. Yes. How, how did you wind up going to law when Marty entered the picture and you were debating this? Well, early on, medical school was eliminated, thank goodness for me, <laughs> because the chemistry labs in the afternoon interfered with Marty's golf practice. Ah, I see. <laughs> so then there were choices business school, law school. For some reason, Marty wanted to go to Harvard. The Harvard Business School didn't admit women in the 1950s. It wasn't until the middle 60s that they did. So that left law school. <laughs> I, I think I can speak for a fair number of people when I say I'm really glad that's where this wound up. Um, now, Marty graduated a year ahead of you, and he went to Harvard and studied his first year of law school. And then after you graduated, you were married. Um, I'm wondering, when you got married, did you receive any particularly useful marriage advice? Oh, yes. <laughs> the best advice I've ever received, and it came from my mother-in-law. The day we were married, we were married in Marty's home. And just before the ceremony, Mother said, Ruth, I would like to tell you the secret of a happy marriage. Oh, I'd be delighted to know. What is it? <laughs> it helps every now and then to be a little deaf. <laughs> so if an unkind or a thoughtless word is spoken, you just tune out, you don't hear it. Now that is advice I have followed not only in a marriage uh, for 56 years, but also to this day in dealing with my colleagues. <laughs> So 
following your marriage, you were, you were, you were off to Fort Sill, uh, where Marty had his military service. And during that time, you and Marty welcomed your daughter, Jane. And from there, you went together to Cambridge to study at Harvard Law School. And you were a year behind Marty. Now, how many women were there in your law school class? There were nine women in a class of over 500. In fact, one of your professors was in my first year class, Mel Eisenberg. And that, that number nine was a big jump from my husband's class. He was a year ahead of me. His class had five women. Harvard didn't start admitting women to the law school until 50, 51 was the first year. So I came in 56. When you look today at the makeup of women in law schools among the law student populations, and, and at a place like Berkeley, where I believe our current population is 60% women, does that make you happy? <laughs> uh, overjoyed, yes. <laughs> that at long last, women are welcomed at the bar and on the bench. So when you were in law school, you were also a mother. Um, and you have said before that having Jane while you were in law school was not a burden, but was actually an advantage. Can you say something about that? What else tend to be consumed by their law studies? My life had balance. I went to class in the morning. I wasted no time. I studied in between classes. But then at 4 o'clock, when the babysitter left, that was Jane's time, we went to the park. We played silly games. Each part of my life was a respite from the other. After an intense day at the law school, I was glad to have a children's hours. And then when Jane went to bed, I was ready to go back to the books. But I think it was appreciation that there is more to life than law school. That accounts for how I did. You are, without fail, the hardest working person I have ever met. And I have often wondered whether your legendary work ethic derived from your law school years. Because uh, as many people know, Marty, became, uh, Marty was diagnosed with cancer while you were in law school together. And I think it's probably fair to say you were faced with rather extraordinary circumstances with all that you had on your respective plate. How did you manage everything? during that period? When Marty was diagnosed with a virulent cancer, they were precious few known survivors. He first had massive surgery, and in those days, I would take my classes in the morning. I had uh, enlisted very good people to be note takers in all of his classes. I would then go to Mass General, come home and take care of Jane. And then after his surgery, he had massive radiation for six weeks every day. And those days, there was no chemotherapy. There was only radiation, and it wasn't pinpointed. It was. So his routine was he would go to the radiation session, come home, get sick, fall asleep. He'd wake up about midnight, and between the hour of midnight till 2 in the morning, whatever he ingested for the day, uh, or, well, maybe that was part of making Marty so eager to get me out of the kitchen. <laughs> but in any event, 
Uh, he would then go over the notes that I had collected for him. And he would dictate to me his senior paper, which was on lost corporations. Tax subject, and, no doubt. And, and then when he, when he was well enough, he had private tutorials that his classmates would come to our apartment and bring Marty up to speed. He, he attended two weeks of classes that final semester. And he ended up with the highest grades he'd ever gotten in law school. <laughs> because he had the best teachers, his own, his own classmates. But we never, uh, we just took each day as it came. And we were going to prevail. I think after those hard months, I decided that whatever came my way, I could handle it. Mm -hmm. When you look back, was there any silver lining to Marty getting sick so early in your family? Well, one was, and I know now from my own personal experience, if you have survived cancer, you have a zest for life that you didn't have before. That you count each day as a blessing. Now, because Marty graduated a year ahead of you, um, and he accepted a job in New York, as everyone knows, you and Jane moved to New York with him, and you enrolled at Columbia Law School, where you took your final year. You graduated tied first for your class, and finding a job, notwithstanding Harvard Law Review, Columbia Law Review, graduating with such honors was very difficult. But you were able to get a clerkship, and one of your great mentors, Professor Gerald Gunther, helped secure it. But he had to secure it under rather interesting terms. How, how did he do that? I graduated from law school in 1959. There was no Title VII. There was no anti-discrimination in employment law. So employers were upfront about wanting no lady lawyers. Some of the sign-up sheets for interviews that were posted at Columbia said men only. A very few firms were willing to take a chance on a woman, but no firm was ready to engage a mother. So uh, Jerry Gunther, who later became a distinguished professor at Stanford Law School, was determined that he would get me a clerkship, and he called every Second Circuit judge, every Eastern District of New York judge, every Southern District. And then he settled on one who had been a Columbia College graduate and a Columbia Law School graduate, always took his clerk from Columbia. And he said, my recommendation for you this year is Ruth Betty Ginsburg. And the judge said, well, her record is good. And I've had women clerks, so that's not a problem. But this is a difficult job. And sometimes we have to work late at night, sometimes even on a Sunday. And I can't risk that she won't be there when I need her. So Gunther gave the judge an offer he could refuse. He said, give her a chance. And if she doesn't work out, there's a young man in her class who's going to a downtown firm who will come in and take over. That was the carrot. The stick was, if you don't give her a chance, I will never recommend another Columbia Law student to you. <laughs> but that, but 
the huge challenge was to get your foot in the door, to get the first job. If you did, you usually did it at least as well as the men, so the second job wasn't at the same hurdle. I compare my experience with Justice O'Connor, who went to Stanford Law School, had very good grades, no one would hire her. So what did she do? She volunteered to work for a county attorney free for four months. And her proposal was, if you think I'm worth it after four months, you can put me on the payroll. And that's how Sandra got her first job in, in the law. It was that first job that was a, a high hurdle. I, I've often told, uh, repeated Sandra's comment. She said, suppose you and I had gone to law school in days when there was no barrier to women. Where would we be now? Now we would be retired partners from some large law firm. <laughs> but because we didn't have that path available to us, we had to find a different one, and we both ended up on the US Supreme Court. <laughs> Now, Professor Gunther must have been an incredible mentor to go to bat for you like that. He also testified, I should share with the audience, at your confirmation proceedings, comparing you to the great judge Learned Hand. Um, so that's, that's, that's nice, a nice compliment from one's former professor. And I assume with his encouragement, you transitioned ultimately to join the Legal Academy. As we said, the justice was the 19th woman law professor in the country. Herma was the 15th. I want to talk about the terms of your appointment at Rutgers. So you joined the law faculty in 1963. This is an important year because it's the year that the Equal Pay Act became law. And so it was no longer legal to pay men and women differently for the same job. And yet you were paid differently than your male counterparts. Why, why was that? Yeah, the Equal Pay Act passed, but it didn't sink in. <laughs> and when the good dean at Rutgers, and he was a very good dean, told me I would have to take a substantial cut in pay. I said I expected that. I knew that Rutgers was part of a state university and didn't have a large budget. But when he told me how much, I was taken aback. And I asked how, how much a man who had about my same years in law school, same experience after, was paid. The dean's answer was, Ruth, he has a wife and two children to support. You have a husband who has a good paying job with a New York law firm. That's the way the thinking was. Well, the women at Rutgers knew her. the women in the entire university campus there began an equal pay suit. And after some years, the suit was settled in 1969. The lowest increase that any woman got was $6,000, which in those days was a lot more than it, than it is today. But it, it took a while for employers, including academic employers, to appreciate first that the Equal Pay Act was law, and then that Title VII really did prohibit gender-based discrimination. On that note, I, I've wanted to ask you about 
what happened in your second year of teaching at Rutgers when you found yourself on a year-to-year -year contract, you did not yet have tenure, and um, you were pregnant with your second child, your son James. There weren't a lot of women around, and there presumably weren't maternity leave policies and the sort of things we take for granted today. How did you navigate that? I didn't tell my colleagues that I was pregnant. And for the last two months of the semester, I wore my mother-in-law's clothes. She was one size larger. <laughs> and then with contract in hand, I told them, when I come back for the fall semester, there'll be a new member of our family. But that experience I had led me, the, the first gender-based discrimination cases I handled were on behalf of pregnant public school teachers. There was what was euphemistically called maternity leave. Maternity leave was unpaid, and there was no guaranteed right of return. Women were asked to leave the classroom when their pregnancy began to show because we mustn't have the little children think that their teacher swallowed a watermelon. <laughs> These were women who wanted to do a day's work for a day's pay and were perfectly capable of remaining in the, in the classroom. So it was my own experience that led me to realize discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is discrimination on the basis of sex. It took a while for the Supreme Court, <laughs> because the first cases that came to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, well, it can't be sex-based discrimination. Because the world is divided into two categories of people. There are non-pregnant people, and that includes women as well as men. <laughs> but then there are these pregnant people, and they are only women. So, there's no male comparator, so it can be. <laughs> well, <laughs> when, when the Supreme Court made that mistake twice, first under the Constitution, then under Title VII, there was a huge lobbying campaign with people from all sides of the political spectrum, and Congress passed a law that was the soul of simplicity that said, what the law meant all along, and the, the amendment was discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is discrimination on the basis of sex. So I want to talk shortly about your litigating career. I, I do have a question I want to ask you. You were teaching law, and, and you know the curriculum of the law schools well. As you look back and you think about the first year curriculum in particular, was there any particular class that was especially helpful to you when you later litigated all those important cases? Um, far and above any other class in law school, it was my first year civil procedure course. <laughs> I was skilled at navigating my way through the federal courts. I had a feeling she might say that. <laughs> now, you uh, were recruited away from Rutgers to Columbia Law School in 1972, as we've heard, as their first tenured law professor. And that timing is, is uh, important because it is the year that Title VII became applicable, finally, to higher educational institutions. Um, by this time, you were litigating. You had started this litigating. And so you're teaching. You're raising two children. You're litigating path-breaking cases. And you're doing all of this at a time when I think it's fair to say, based on everything you've said and everything we know, that society wasn't especially supportive of working women. And so I wanted to ask you, because one of the leading questions I get from my students in office hours is, how, how do you make it work? How do you find this work-life balance? 
And in particular, I get a lot of questions from my students about how they can enter this extremely demanding profession and also raise a family. And I wonder if you have any advice from your experience on that. Uh, my number one advice is choose a partner in life who thinks that your work is as important as his. The money is always my biggest booster. And he also uh, wanted to be an equal partner in parenting. He had an idea that a child's personality was formed in her first year of life. So even when in the days we were at Fort Sill, Marty was a very caring parent to our daughter. He, he once said, I have been supportive of my wife since the beginning of time, and she has been supportive of me. It's not sacrifice, it's family. And I think that's pretty, pretty special. He was also legendarily funny, and I'm sure that that kept you on your toes a little bit over the years. Yes, Marty had a wonderful sense of humor. One typical example, when I was a brand new judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, I was introduced at receptions as Judge Gidsburg. As often as not, the hand would go out to Marty. <laughs> and he would reply, she's Judge Ginsburg. I'm still hopeful. At <laughs> <laughs> the time, it was, it was just after the court decided Bush v. Gore. And we were attending a theater in New York. When I came back from intermission, everyone stood up and applauded. And Marty said, oh, I forgot to tell you, there's a tax lawyer's convention in town. <laughs> Now, Marty was so important for so many reasons in your life, but not the least of which is he handed you the tax court sheets that led to that first case in a series of cases. Um, it, Moritz. Moritz. Can, yeah. And that case wound up proving to be a gold mine. It was over a $600 deduction. The two of you litigated it together. Ultimately, you prevailed in the Tenth Circuit, and a lot of this is told in, in a recent movie on the basis of sex. Mm -hmm. The it, movie, by the way, it, the script was written by my nephew. And I asked him, why, why did you pick the Moritz case? Because it didn't go to the Supreme Court. And he said he wanted to tell the story of a marriage as much as the story of the development of a legal strategy. So. Charles E. Moritz had a mother. He took good care of her, though she was 93. He was a book salesman, and in order to work, he hired a nurse to take care of his mother. At the time, the tax code gave a deduction, $600, not a whole lot, to a person who took care of a child, an elderly parent, an infirm relative of any age. The deduction was available to any woman or any married or divorced man. Tulsi Marts was a never married man, so he didn't fit. He argued his own case in the tax court. He filed a brief that was the soul of simplicity. It said, if I were a dutiful daughter, I would get this deduction. 
I'm a dutiful son. It should make no difference. I, I once read something that Marty wrote about this, or maybe it was a speech in which he said it was the best legal brief he ever read. <laughs> <laughs> so this case was so important because uh, it didn't go to the Supreme Court, but it, the government tried to take it to yes. the Supreme Court. And they did something in their briefing that was very helpful to you as you launched the Women's Rights Project. Uh, yes. The, uh, Congress had already amended the law so that any person could get the deduction. So there was no continuing a problem. But the government urged the Supreme Court to take the case nonetheless because the Tenth Circuit decision cast a cloud of unconstitutionality on dozens of federal statutes. Now, these were pre-computer days, but the Defense Department computer did uh, provide every single provision of the US code that differentiated on the basis of sex. So there it was, right out in front of us, all the laws that needed to be changed or eliminated through legislation, if you could do it, if not through litigation. So it, it, was, it was our roadmap. It was a pearl beyond price that, to have that, that list of federal statutes that differentiated on the basis of gender, and most of them fit in with the way the laws were operating at the time. That is, man was considered the breadwinner, and a spouse would get benefits as a dependent. If a woman was the breadwinner, there were no benefits for her spouse, because women were considered at best pin money earners. Their main job was home and family life. A man winning bread to su support the family. What we needed to do was to break down that separate spheres, spheres notion and have Congress use neutral terms, wage earner, not male. And the same for child care. You know, one of my favorite cases was the Weisenfeld case. It was a man whose wife died in childbirth. Congress had provided for benefits for a widow who has the care of a young child, but not for a widower. So my client, Stephen Weisenfeld, was bound and determined not to work full time till his child was in school full time. And he thought that with the social security benefits and the earnings that he could make and still keep the benefits, he would have enough to take care of himself and his son. But those benefits were available only to widows, not widowers. The Supreme Court was a little puzzled by that case. They reached a unanimous judgment, but there were three reasons. Justice Brennan, who wrote for the majority, said, Stephen Weisenfeld is feeling the harm, but the discrimination was against his wife as wage earner. She paid the same social security taxes as a man, but she doesn't get the same protection for her family. A few of them thought it was discrimination against the male as parent because the male parent wouldn't even have the opportunity to care personally for his, his child. He would have to work full time to support family. Then there was one who later became my chief. He was 
than Justice Rehnquist. He said, this is utterly irrational from the point of view of the baby. Why should the baby have care of a sole surviving parent if that parent is female, but not if the parent is male? So the court was getting the message. Congress was too. And this separate spheres mentality was passe. So I was researching about you and Herma for this event, and you wrote some years before that in the foreword to your book uh, that although men historically have gained the greater share of power and prestige, they are no less trapped in their assigned roles. Mm -hmm. and so it was as though you foresaw that this was going to be a good path for litigation to finally have the justices understand and see discrimination. That being said, as you look back on your arguments, there are two arguments in which you spoke for over 10 minutes uninterrupted. That, putting aside that that would never happen on the Supreme Court today, why was that? Was it because it was hard to convince them? I was puzzled. The first argument was Frontiero against Richardson. I wondered, are they just indulging me? because I don't think I have anything worthwhile to say? Or are they really listening and beginning to think in a new way? Now, in that argument, you know, I wanted to do something attention-grabbing, so I quoted from Sarah Grimke, who is a great abolitionist and feminist. I quoted her line, I ask no favor for our sex, all I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet from off our necks. <laughs> but I think the, the, the prevailing notion among judges was that women were favorites of the law. For example, many states didn't put women on juries, or they gave them an automatic exemption. My state, New York, had an exemption for a woman. I tried to point out that that kind of favor says something about how the society views women. That is, men have to serve. It's obligatory. But the women are expendable. And if you're a citizen, you have obligations as well as rights. One is to vote, another is to serve on juries. And to exempt women uh, was demeaning in the sense that the society didn't, didn't need women to participate in the administration of justice. Or take Gossett against Cleary, a 1948 case, during World War II, when men were off fighting in the war, women began to occupy fields that had up till then been reserved for women. And one popular field for women was bartending. So when the war is over, the state of Michigan passes a law saying, a woman may not tend bar unless she is the wife or the daughter of the male tavern owner. The plaintiff in the case was Gossard. Gossard was a woman who owned a bar. Her daughter was her bartender. This law would have put them immediately out of business. And the Supreme Court opinion upholding the law said, this is protective of women. Bars are unpleasant places. There's a lot of rowdy people there, and we need to spare women from that. Never, never acknowledging that the prohibition was only on the bartender who was behind a bar. Bar maids could take the drinks to the rowdy men, and, they, and that, was, that was okay. It was 
to get the court to understand that what was once thought of as protections, well, as Justice Brennan put it so well, the pedestal on which women are thought to stand more often turns out to be a cage. It confines women from contributing to society in any way that their talent allowed them to contribute. So we're getting them to understand that women were not the favorites of the law, that they were hemmed in by these restrictions. Another one, women couldn't serve tables at night. Well, at night is when you get the best tips. They were getting them to understand that these protections were protecting men's jobs against women's competition. So you accomplished so much as an advocate, and, and you've also done a great deal as a justice. When you sit down and you look at the progress that has been made on, on gender discrimination over the course of your lifetime, and you look ahead, what work do you think remains to be done? In the 70s, um, our mission was to get rid of the explicit gender-based classification. And that job was almost completed by the end of the decade. What remained, and is hard to get at, is unconscious bias. And my best example of that is the symphony orchestra. A well-known music critic for the New York Times, Howard Taubman, said, blindfold me, and I can tell you if it's a woman playing the piano or a man, or same for the violin. So they decided, some people, some of his colleagues decided to put him to the test, so they blindfolded him, had people play, and he was all mixed up. He said it was a man when it was a woman, and he came to understand that, yes, he saw a woman sitting down at the piano, and he had a lesser expectation of what she would be. Uh, a, a Title VII case brought in the 70s is also a good illustration. It was brought against AT&T by women who were disproportionately uh, kept out of middle management jobs. The women did as well as the men on all the criteria, except the very last one, which they called the total person test. Total person test is the interviewer sitting down with candidate for promotion. And that's where women dropped out. Why? Not because the interviewer was hell-bent on keeping women out of those jobs, but because he felt a certain discomfort dealing with someone who was not like himself. He's confronting a white male. He has a comfort level. If he is confronting someone of another race or a woman, he's kind of uncomfortable. He doesn't really know how this person ticks. And that discomfort is reflected in his giving the woman a lower rating. There was a wonderful case in the European Court of Justice on this point of unconscious bias. It involved a, a certain province in Germany that had a rule for, for government jobs if there are two people of roughly equal qualifications, prefer the woman. And that was challenged as in violation of the equality provision of the Rome Treaty, the, the principal uh, treaty that started the European Union. But between the lines, you could see what the court is appreciating 
that it may not be a preference for the woman. It may be just overcoming the unconscious bias that she would encounter when the employer had a choice between a woman and a man. So unconscious bias is, is a problem. I'm, I'm delighted today when I go to a concert and I see women all over the orchestra. Uh, women are emerging as conductors. In my growing up years, that was beyond imagining. So I want to jump ahead. We're, we're rapidly running out of time. My students normally, if it were just me up here, would complain and say, you're going over, Professor Tyler. I think this is one day where they might not complain if I go a little bit over. President Carter put you on the DC circuit in 1980, and then in 1993, while Herma Hill Kay was dean of Berkeley Law, you were put on the Supreme Court. So in what little time we have left, I want to ask you a couple of questions about your time on the Supreme Court. Now, you're starting your 27th term this month on the Supreme Court. And I know you're just getting warmed up. <laughs> but after 26 years, I wonder whether you look back and you take stock of some of the things that have happened. And in particular, I wonder whether there's one opinion that you wrote of which you're most proud. Uh, that's a little like of my four grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Two step-grandchildren, one great-grandchild. Uh, which one do I love the most? <laughs> um, but there are some s opinions that stand out. One is the VMI case. And Marty's comment about that was, well, it took you 20 years to to win the Vorcheimer case, but you finally did. So what was Vorcheimer? There were two high schools in Philadelphia for gifted children. One was called Central High School, and the other, Girls High. Central had better math and science facilities, infinitely better uh, playing fields. When that case came to the Supreme Court, the district court had held in favor of the plaintiff. The Court of Appeals reversed two to one, so the, the tally was two to two. And then the Supreme Court affirmed the Third Circuit's wrong decision by an equally divided court. VMI was the same kind of case the state of Virginia was making an opportunity available to men that was not available to women. I was sometimes asked, well, what woman would want to go to VMI and go through that rigorous training and the rat line? And I said, well, I wouldn't. Probably you wouldn't either. But there are women who want to go to VMI and meet all the qualifications, the state can't leave them out. VMI decision is now, or I was a couple of years ago, to celebrate the 21st anniversary of the decision. They are so proud of their women cadets who want to be engineers, nuclear scientists. They like being exposed to the same rigorous training. They live in the same Spartan quarters that the men do. And the, the commander is so pleased with the change in the school. For one thing, they were able to upgrade their applicant pool. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> There's another case that I love. So some of my favorite opinions are dissents is Lily Ledbetter's case. Uh, Lily Ledbetter was an area manager for a Goodyear tire plant. 
She was one of the first women hired for that position. One day, she found in her mailbox a slip of paper with a series of numbers. And she immediately recognized what those numbers meant. The numbers were the pay of all the area managers. And Lily Ledbetter saw that she was being paid less than the young man that she had trained to do the job. So she said, I've had it. I've heard about Title VII. I'll sue. She prevailed in the district court. She got a sizable jury verdict. When the case came to the Supreme Court, they said, uh, Lily Ledbetter sued too late. Title VII requires that you file a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission within 180 days of the discriminatory incident. And Lily Ledbetter, you've been working there a dozen years. You're much, you're way out of time. I tried to make the point that what would have happened if Lily Ledbetter did sue early on? Well, first, the employer didn't give out pay figures, so how would she know? But assuming she did, the defense inevitably would have been, she just doesn't do the job as well as the men, that's why we pay her less. But then she's working there a dozen years and she's getting good performance ratings by the employer. So that defense that she doesn't do the job as well is off the page. The first woman in a field that has been dominated by men doesn't want to be seen as a troublemaker. She doesn't want to rock the boat. What about the 180-day limit? Well, every paycheck that Lily had better received incorporated that discrimination. So, in my view, a suit 180 days of, within 180 days of her most recent paycheck is timely. The tagline of my dissent in her case was, the ball is now in Congress's court to correct the error into which my colleagues have fallen. <laughs> and in very short order, with overwhelming majorities, Republicans as well as Democrats, Congress amended the law to, uh, to adopt the, the paycheck theory. And it was the first piece of legislation that President Obama signed when he took mm -hmm. office. Justice, I could sit here and do this all day. But I suppose at some point we have to stop, and unfortunately I think we're at time. So I wanted to close uh, by saying thank you, and, and by bringing someone back into the conversation who's been looming large and, and beautifully over us as we've spoken, Herma Hill Kay. Her legacy here at UC Berkeley is wonderful and longstanding, and this is the first of many events that will honor her and keep that legacy alive. I thought that the best way to conclude would, to bring, would be to bring her back into the conversation through her words, and specifically by quoting from her testimony at your confirmation proceedings. So in 1993, when then Dean of Berkeley Law, Herma Hill Kay, appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee, she said that President Clinton's choice of you was wise and inspired. And she testified that you think deeply and choose your words with care. She continued, I can tell you that her compassion is as deep as her mind is brilliant. 
In Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the President has offered the country a justice worthy of the title. I couldn't have said it better myself. Justice, it has been such a privilege to be up here with you today honoring Herma Hill Kay. On behalf of UC Berkeley, thank you for being with us today. Thank you.